Hello. Muriel Gray is the author of three horror novels, The Trickster, Furnace, and most recently, The Ancient, plus a book on climbing the Munros. She went to art college, and she was in a band called The Von Trapp Family. She's a TV and radio presenter. She started out on Channel 4's The Tube in the early 80s, and she also runs one of the leading TV production companies in the UK. It's called Ideal World. But today, Muriel puts aside all those accomplishments and becomes the latest in a series of distinguished people whom we asked to nominate a great life. Muriel Gray, welcome. And whose great life have you chosen? Well, with enormous pleasure, I've chosen M.R. James, who is one of my all-time heroes. I think one of the, the greatest writers of Supernatural, I think, that's ever lived. He's affected a whole generation of horror and supernatural writers, and I'm just dying to find out more about him. Montague Rhodes James, born in 1862, and uh, it was said of him that he was gifted with an almost diabolic power of calling horror by gentle steps from the midst of prosaic daily life. Um, Muriel, how much is your own writing in, in horror genre, in, in the M.R. James tradition? <laughs> well, I mean, that would be ridiculously boastful to say any of it is, because obviously, I mean, he's a master and I'm an absolute amateur, but in terms of a, an homage to M.R. James, I based my middle novel, Furnace, entirely on one of his famous short stories, Casting of the Runes, which I did, you know, quite openly, and I just set it in a modern-day American setting, using a truck driver instead of the, of the character in M.R. James's novel. But what I was trying to do, which I think every writer of the supernatural tries to do is to capture that essence that M.R. James invented. I really believe that he invented it of creeping psychological unseen horror, things that are unspoken, unknowable, and the end of the psyche rather than, than giving somebody a fright. Now, if one can even do a fraction of that in the way that James did it, then you would be a genius. Um, uh, so I would never compare anything I've written to anything M.R. James has written, so let's not mention that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, with us as well on Great Lives is an excellent expert on our nominator's choice today. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Sir Christopher Frayling, Rector of the Royal College of Art, historian, author, lecturer and critic. His book and TV series Nightmare, The Birth of Horror, won the Hamilton Dean Award in 1997. Christopher Frayling, where does your fascination with Monty James, M.R. James, come from? Well, I first read him at a very, very impressionable age, when I was about 12, actually, the collected ghost stories and rapidly realised he was a very, very special kind of writer. He is the best writer of ghost stories in the language, and that's, that's quite a claim because there's an awful lot of rivals. But latterly, I've identified with him rather, not, not as a writer, but for this strange double life that he led as an academic, like Tolkien, spending a little bit of time on The Hobbit, but most of his time on medieval literature, like C.S. Lewis, writing Christian apologetics and then The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, or like Lewis Carroll with his photographs of, of little girls at the same time as being a professor of mathematics. You know, this double life. Well, in the case of James, he had an academic life, but he also had this life every Christmas writing these ghost stories. And as an academic, I rather like that idea that you have this this possibility of opening a door onto a dark a rather passionate world which is very very different from what you do from nine to five so at both levels I think I identified with him. Muriel do you see him as a split personality on a more deep level than Christopher saying? Actually no I didn't the two things to me seemed to be joined at the hip really in a way and um, I remember somebody writing an article about the research Emma James must have done for his ghost stories but I thought it was the opposite it seemed to me that he was probably stuck in a little dusty library doing research anyway when a, an idea occurred to him that came out of the, the research he was doing for scholarly purposes rather than the other way around. And of course the world that he inhabited was full of the supernatural anyway, particularly if he was a medieval scholar. It was full of enormous superstition. In the books he was reading, the, the books he was reading, precisely, would, would, be a, would be a great leap of the imagination. But the thing that made him very different though was that the gothic ghost story writers that came before him were really obsessed with this rather tiresome uh, human reincarnations of ghosts, whereas M. R. James invented, and I'm absolutely certain he did because I can't find anybody before him who did this. His creatures were elemental, feral, animal-like. They had very little relation to do with, with any kind of disturbed human force. They were things that were unknowable, untouchable, and of you know from a dark place of the imagination that really I think touches everybody. Christopher Frailing, do you agree that that was James's contribution? Yes, I think he's definitely carried over his research, his, in quotes, serious research into, into the ghost stories. I've got in front of me the two full-scale biographies of M.R. James. One of them, uh, which is about uh, 350 pages, devotes five pages to the ghost stories. <laughs> The rest of it's about his scholarly work, his research into the Apocrypha. He was absolutely fascinated all his life by books that pretended to be part of the Bible, but weren't. 
and he wanted to know where they all came from. So there's obviously a connection there with, with the ghost stories. Fascinated by medieval manuscripts, by apocalypses, these depictions of the Revelation, the Book of Revelation, where a medieval artists had a go at the end of the world, what might it be like with all the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and all this. He was absolutely fascinated by that subject. So there's one biography that's all about that, and the other one relates everything to the ghost stories, and that in a way his serious research is a kind of prelude to the ghost stories. I don't think either is right. The truth lies in the middle. He spent most of his time researching these rather esoteric areas and while he was doing so picked up all sorts of details that he carried over into the ghost stories. I think it's time we got specific about particular M.R. James stories. Now um, a poll taken among some of his enthusiasts gives top place to a whistle and I'll come to you my lad but casting the runes comes a close second. Now I remember the ghost or whatever it is in the first of those stories as taking the form of a bundled up bunch of bed sheets. That's right, isn't it, Demiral? Right. Yes, well, what's one of the forms, but I mean there's a sense of the presence of it you know, throughout. That's again his great strength. That's his, that's his only manifestation, but, but of course the because the victim knows that it's there all the time for the first time he makes a mistake. Right. And, you know. but, but remind me, you say you actually based an entire novel on it. Remind me about Casting the Runes. What happens in that? Well, Casting the Runes is, um, concerns a chap, an academic called Carswell, who was to have his paper and the paranormal presented, I think it's at the Royal Society, and who shun him and make fun of him. And uh, the person who writes him the rather snotty letter turning him down uh, for this presentation, well, he's warned, first of all, by Carswell that something very, very unpleasant is going to happen to him. And he's passed a piece of paper uh, which has a runic symbol on it. And the, the rules of this, which I don't know, I'm not terribly sure if M.R. James made this up, if you're past these runes, this piece of paper, you have the time permitted written on it until a demon will take you and nothing you can do except pass the paper back to the person who passed it to you who must take it willingly and unknowingly will save you now that sounds complicated it isn't at all it's a very simple premise which james sets up so beautifully and so clearly and precisely christopher frailing you're a film expert as well as a book expert i mean do you feel that filmmakers have learned anything from james understating the ghost not showing us the ghost in close up well, sadly, they haven't learned enough, I don't think. There was this great debate when James was writing his ghost stories at the turn of the 19th, 20th century about explicitness. He thought that Dracula, for example, which had recently been published, was much too explicit and much too much sex in it. You can't put sex in nasty stories. Perish the thought. <laughs> um, and too much sex, too much violence, which significantly he always allied with one another. He always spoke about them in the same breath. And that he felt it that horror stories became more memorable if you were less explicit, that if you were just in the corner of the retina, you don't quite see it, it's not in your face, it's just in the corner of your eye, like in Whistle and I'll Come to You, this thing that follows uh, the central character along the beach, he can just see it out of the corner of his eye, and he can't quite see the shape of it, but he knows it's there, and every time he turns around it goes. That is more memorable to James than a vampire coming at you full face and biting you. Now, where the movies are concerned, certainly up until quite recently, that isn't a lesson that they've learned. They've gone for schlock, they've gone for special effects, they've been chucking things at us. Uh, films like The Blair Witch Project, which actually resembles M.R. James' stories, have gone back to a more sort of degree zero kind of horror, where you don't see a thing. Blinking it's all done by... It, yeah. yeah, but on the whole, I'm afraid, Hollywood has gone for the, uh, the explicit approach. James did set out various uh, rules for ghost stories. He said on one occasion that he believed a good ghost story should have an evil ghost. The ghost should be malevolent or odious. Amiable and helpful apparitions are all very well in fairy tales or in local legends, but I've no use for them in a fictitious ghost story. How seriously does M.R. James take evil? Is it just a device for making the reader frightened? Christopher Frayling. Well, I think it's a double level thing, as so often with M.R. James. Remember these stories were originally told orally, as if round a campfire, but actually in, in the rooms at King's College, Cambridge. They really were, they were ad-libbed. Yeah, uh, not ad-libbed, he wrote them and read them uh -huh. to a, a group of um, undergraduates and postgraduates and dons in King's College, Cambridge. Every Christmas, usually Christmas Eve, they gather in the Dean's rooms with the candle and he'd read this story. And they were pretty camp occasions by all accounts. People would laugh a lot, there'd be pranks, there'd be abstruse sort of jokes about medieval Latin or, you know, Monty, was the telephone invented in those days? All that sort of stuff. And, uh, and so in the telling, they were quite lightweight. But when you read them and actually compare them to M.R. James's more, in quote, serious writings, I think he meant them at quite a profound level. He was brought up a fundamentalist Christian at a rectory in Suffolk. He believed, he clearly believed in the reality of evil. 
he almost took holy orders, but disappointed his family by not doing so when he, when he was in his 20s. He kept having recurring dreams about the Last Judgment. There he was in the afterlife confronting someone who has the scales or the balances or a big book. So the reality of the Last Judgment and the afterlife were very, very strong with M.R. James. And I think, in a way, one has to get back inside his head as a fundamentalist Christian to get full value out of these stories. There's a reality about the evil that's very, very chilling. That's absolutely fascinating. One of the things I wondered about him, and again, Christopher, maybe you can you can enlighten me. If you remember the story Lost Hearts, Mr. Abney, there's a wonderful piece at the end of that where we see right into Abney's mind where he's simply a scholar who's so separated from human emotion. He even describes the ghosts that are bothering him by saying some annoyance can be expected from the psychic portion of the subjects. And I've always thought that perhaps that was M.R. James, that he himself was very separated, very disengaged from emotions and from relationships, obviously, because since he had none. I know. Um, and I wonder if Abney was actually quite autobiographical. Well, I think they all are. You know, I think if you actually, I mean, characterization, to be honest, is not M.R. James's strong point. I mean, basically, there's a central character who's a university researcher who's probably studying a slightly eccentric subject that isn't quite mainstream, a little bit like James's research interests in, in the Apocrypha rather than in the Bible, who go out of their normal setting, usually in the long vacation or on sabbatical or visiting front. So they're out of their element where they're at their most vulnerable because these people thrive in the senior common room surrounded by the all male society of Cambridge in, in the late 19th century. So they're out of their element and particularly vulnerable and something breaks through their normal reserve. They, you know, the emotional armor is, is you know, the, the visor has clanged shut, but something opens it by coming through the portal. It's what the spiritualists call the apport. Something triggers the nastiness. It's usually an old manuscript or an old illustration. And the apport leads you into a world that's, that's all passion. And Freudians would say it's very sexual. I mean, towards the end of his life, all M.R. James's ghosts are pink, slightly hairy, <laughs> they come out of crevices, they're moist, they're clammy, they're very, very tactile. Now, I don't want to take this too far, like thing but, you know, something's going on that Freudians would have a field day with. I think one's got to make a quick comparison with his namesake, Henry James, well, Turn of the Screw. it's very interesting that his publisher, Arnold, when he first published his first collection of ghost stories, The Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, that Arnold actually confused M.R. James with Henry James, who'd recently published The Turn of the Screw, the great story about the possession of children, and said, uh, do you think your brother uh, uh, could actually contribute to this collection as well, because I gather he's quite good at ghost stories. Yeah, so we actually James confused the, both the James families. Yeah. They are a bit different. I mean, in fact, M.R. James didn't like the turn of the screw. Which is very sexual. Yeah, I think, I, I think he saw that what we would now call the Freudian interpretation is running right through that story. He didn't like that. He said there should be a tiny chink of rational explanation, but only a tiny chink. Basically, the supernatural was real. Whereas in, in, in Henry James, the chink is very large. You yeah. can read that story and say nothing's actually yeah, happened. Yeah, it's all it's the interpretation, of course, yes. 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 Now, you mentioned, Christopher, that uh, James was brought up as a child at Livermere in Suffolk, and uh, he was skilled at using places he knew and visited as realistic settings for his ghost stories. He twisted their beauty into something sinister, and his own Suffolk home is no exception. You are asked to think of the spacious garden of a country rectory, adjacent to a park of many acres, and separated therefrom by a belt of trees of some age which we knew as the plantation. It is but about thirty or forty yards broad. A close gate of split oak leads to it from the path encircling the garden, and when you enter it from that side, you put your hand through a square hole cut in it and lift the hook to pass along to the iron gate which admits to the park from the plantation. To be sure, it is difficult in anything like a grove to be quite certain that nobody is making a screen out of a tree and keeping it between you and him as he moves round it and you walk on. All I can say is, if such an one was there, he was no neighbour or acquaintance of mine, and there was some indication about him of being cloaked or hooded. Muriel Gray, there's wonderful restraint in all that, isn't there? It's very hesitant, is there somebody there or not? And the little detail I love of the square hole leading to the latch. I mean, that's his strength, isn't it? It's suggestion. I mean, it's, as Christopher pointed out, it's peripheral. And it's peripheral horror, you know, what's behind you, what's just outside your vision. I think also there's an element of romanticism about M.R. James, which we're really not touching upon, and, and which actually it seduced me, certainly as a young girl, because I grew up, obviously, reading 
Edwardian children's stories like Inesbeth and so on. You know, I mean, the story of the amulet, which I read, I think, probably about 50 times. I loved it so much. It was very similar. It had a scholarly gentleman taking these mm. children on this marvellous adventure. So there was a lot about the romanticism about that era in M.R. James that attracted me, the beauty of these gardens, these old disused, beautiful places, scholarly gentlemen getting railway carriages to beautiful little seaside towns to research things. So that, that, that draws you in with a, a romantic reality. And then when the, the darkness comes rushing in there, this peripheral darkness, it is utterly beguiling. I think it touches you in almost every sense. It seems that he had nightmares as a child. It's possibly a reason for his choice of genre as a writer. Here he is talking about this in the Evening Standard in 1931. What first interested me in ghosts? This I can tell you quite definitely. In my childhood, I chanced to see a toy Punch and Judy set with figures cut out in cardboard. One of these was the ghost. It was a tall figure, habited in white, with an unnaturally long and narrow head, also surrounded with white and a dismal visage. Upon this, my conceptions of a ghost were based, and for years it permeated my dreams. Well, despite the nightmares, Monty James's childhood seems to have been a happy one. At least his family was close-knit and affectionate, but he himself was always interested, if not obsessed, with the macabre. As a young man, he liked to collect stories about the martyrdom of saints. The more atrocious, the better. And when he wrote to his mother, he included... Splendid specimens of original art. Including a severed head dripping with blood. Frederick, after death. A martyr having his eyes removed and... An ancient sagacious abbot with one hand cut off. His father jokingly described young Monty as a psychical researcher. And all this obviously is boyish fun, but um, Christopher Frayling, do we have any reason to suppose that he was seriously interested in the supernatural? Well, I think he had, he had a very happy childhood, but a, a, a surprisingly bookish one. He was unbelievably precocious where books were concerned, and he was writing with confidence by the time he was about seven. His first major publication was when he was 16. He haunted second-hand bookshops and antiquarian books and indeed the family library from a very, very early age. So he's surrounded by all these sort of leather-bound tomes, uh, usually with some biblical connection. And that extract we heard about the gate with the hole in it is very, very interesting because it wasn't actually published in James's lifetime. It was published posthumously. He didn't actually want to publish it as one of his ghost stories. And I believe it was one of the very few occasions where he lifted the veil and told us something about himself. Because what you've got there is this bookish boy living in the rectory, going into the garden and having this incredibly rich fantasy life with the wall is mythologized. The gate is a, this white face, the other side of the wall. So he, at a very early age, he developed this way of breaking out of the rather repressive environment. And I think this twilight world gave him some kind of emotional relief from the rather repressed bookish atmosphere of, of, of the home. So it was happy, yes, but it was incredibly blanket. And emotionally, he always had problems expressing himself. I mean, he said this very often, that this reticence was... In letters, he could pour it out. When he wrote, he could actually say how much affection he held his friends in. He never married, and um, he might have been gay, he might not. I, no one knows, but I, I think he was an old-fashioned celibate Don who could express himself only when he thought about writing it on paper. I mean, face to face, he couldn't express his emotions at all. He just spluttered, went purple, and walked out of the room if anyone confronted him with anything emotional. Muriel, would you like to have met him? Oh, I would absolutely have loved to have met him. But the problem is, uh, you know, being a, a woman, I don't think he would have particularly liked to have met me. <laughs> uh, he doesn't seem to have much affinity uh, for women either in his writing and uh, obviously in his in his life. Um, so I would have liked to have dressed as a boy in Shakespearean way and perhaps <laughs> pretended to be a student <laughs> and sat at his knee listening to one of these ghost stories, I think I would give a great deal of money to have that experience. Now, he was sent to Eton, which he loved, and uh, where they remembered him 20 years later as the learned boy. He wasn't as happy when he went to King's Cambridge, but he stayed on to become an assistant in classical archaeology at the Fitzwilliam Museum, and later he became a university lecturer in divinity. In fact, posts in Cambridge University almost seemed to drop into his lap. It is a constant puzzle, or if not puzzle, surprise to me that I have never shared the ambitions or speculations about a career which ordinary people have, and ought to have, choice of profession, home of one's own, and all such. I believe there never was a time when I have had more of a program than to find out all I could about various matters, and to make friends. Positions and objectives have been the same. It has not been a case of amiable modesty, but something more like indolence or if a long word is better, opportunism.
Now, having ascended the academic ladder at King's Cambridge to Provost, he then did a spell as Vice-Chancellor of Cambridge during the First World War. His research led him to travel, and uh, he used his experiences during these trips to give some of his stories foreign settings. Count Magnus, for example, is set in Sweden. Number 13 is in Denmark. Christopher Frayling, are these as effective as his stories with English settings? Oh, definitely, I think. Uh, the, um, I mean, his very first published ghost story, Canon Albrecht's scrapbook, which is set at this church in the foot of the Pyrenees, is in Bertrand de Comage, is fantastically evocative. Some of his best writing, actually, about a building. Um, and it has an illustration by a close friend of his called McBride, who based it on a photograph that James had took of the interior of the church. It's very, very specific. No, I think um, they're particularly effective, actually, I think, when they go abroad, because the academics are even more out of their milieu yes, than they usually these, are. These, these English academics mm. are all stranded, aren't they? And, yes, absolutely. And, and one of the other things that's always struck me about James is that in mean, other ghost stories, particularly written by somebody who's middle or upper class, they always imbue the working class with some kind of intuition, like, oh, we don't want to go down there, sir. <laughs> they that they know, so, exactly. Whereas Whereas his, uh, not at all. In fact, the the the, the working class couple in, in in Ken Albrecht's scrapbook just want rid of the scrap because they know what happens, you know. And Mrs. Bunch in Lost Hearts hasn't a clue that Abney is, is up to. He just thinks he's an absolutely wonderful benefactor. These these children. I mean, even within the setting you've described, this this all male closed world of of King's Cambridge and Eton College, uh, he was very very conservative. And by by the time of the First World War, he was a very out of date sort of Victorian figure. I mean, he didn't approve. Of giving degrees for women. The thing he hated above all was people who studied mythology in the modern way. A book came out called The Golden Bough, which is a sort of social study of myth, where you look at, um, uh, say, biblical stories or, or uh, in, in quotes, primitive myths and relate them all to each other. It's a sort of language. Of, he hated that. In fact, in Casting the Runes, he has a wonderful sideswipe. He says, you know, um, Mr. Carswell, you know, didn't know the difference between The Golden Bough and any other book and all this. You know, he sometimes settled scores in, in, in his ghost stories. But the whole style of the stories, too, I think, is, and it's one of its most attractive features, has that whole world of Cambridge conservatism. You get that through the prose, and in a way, that's part of the attraction, although it's deeply conservative and very politically incorrect. incorrect. It's, uh, it is now part of the attraction of those stories. I think a word or two more we need about his attitude to women. He was, as you said, Christopher, strongly opposed to women taking university degrees, and he writes scathingly about some female fellow travellers on a trip to Cyprus. They object to him smoking. They play the worst kinds of music, and to cap it all, the beast was knitting during dinner. <laughs> But he did have female friends. He seems to have had a rather flirtatious relationship with Sybil Cropper, the sister-in-law of one of his friends, and he was attracted to the sister of another friend, Stella Duckworth. He told his mother Stella was extremely beautiful, and he returned from a visit to the Duckworth family house because... It really was becoming dangerous. After a close friend called James McBride died of appendicitis, Monty looked after McBride's widow and daughter, and he translated the tales of Hans Christian Andersen for the little girl. There's some evidence that Jane McBride hoped that Monty would ask her to marry him, but he didn't. In the end, then, Christopher, he shuts women out. Yes, there's one or two of his friends who get married where he actually writes uh, a rather sweet letter to them saying, you have picked just the right girl, and I'll miss you, you won't be able to come to my after-dinner meetings in the Dean's room, but good on you. Uh, well, he would never put it that way. You know, it, that uh, you've made a very good marriage, just one or two. Now, on the whole, there is a streak of misogyny actually running, running through his life, I think. Perhaps misogyny is too strong. It is an all-male society where people, the camaraderie and the intellectual stimulation and the competitiveness and all that is, is second nature to him. He's gone straight from uh, a rectory in Suffolk to Eton to King's, then back to Eton in his last ten years of life. I mean, he never left that world. He was enclosed within this all-male society. He was rather frightened of women. And indeed, quite a lot of his ghosts have female characteristics. Mm. They're feline and, uh, you know, and this sort of thing. And the, there is a sense that some of them are, you know, the feminine principle, trying, if I want to be reductive about it, trying to break through this portal, and he's terrified of them. Let's hear another of his rules for writing a successful ghost story. Let us then be introduced to the actors in a placid way. Let us see them going about their ordinary business, undisturbed by forebodings, pleased with their surroundings, and into this calm environment let the ominous thing put out its head, unobtrusively at first, and then more insistently, until it holds the stage. He was an incredibly hard worker, one person wrote of him. Monty James, with his amazing knowledge and power of absorbing learning without seeming to work, with his boyish and untidy humour and his unruffled goodness, is a dangerous model for young men who have to make their own way in the world. 
On the other hand, he was never a great or profound thinker. In fact, he resisted intellectual debate. He found it disturbing. One story of his time as Dean of Kings in Cambridge finds him in the presence of two young men who are discussing some philosophical problem, and he's said to have rapped sharply on the table with his pipe and called out, No thinking, gentlemen, please. <laughs> Lovely. He never made any great claims for his stories. If any of them succeeded in causing their readers to feel pleasantly uncomfortable when walking along a solitary road at nightfall or sitting over a dying fire in the small hours, my purpose in writing them will have been attained. And of course, he's brilliant at conjuring up fear through understatement. For example, here's the first appearance of the ghost in A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad. One last look behind to measure the distance he had made since leaving the ruined Templar's church showed him a prospect of company on his walk, in the shape of a rather indistinct personage who seemed to be making great efforts to catch up with him, but made little, if any, progress. I mean that there was an appearance of running about his movements, but that the distance between him and Parkins did not seem materially to lessen. So at least Parkins thought, and decided that he almost certainly did not know him, and that it would be absurd to wait until he came up. For all that company, he began to think, would really be very welcome on that lonely shore, if only you could choose your companion. In his unenlightened days, he'd read of meetings in such places which even now would hardly bear thinking of. Well, M. R. James died in post as provost of Eton College in 1936. Muriel Gray, do you think he's an entertainer rather than a great writer? I think he's both, which, you know, all of the greatest writers are. I think perhaps his art lies in the concealment of art, in a way, if that's not too pretentious. The fact that he did this so effortlessly just marks out his genius. But entertaining he is, and a great writer he is, absolutely, undoubtedly. Christopher Frayling, how do you rate him on the Richter scale of quality? Well, I think I'd like to, just to add to what you're saying is he wasn't a great thinker. He was an astonishing scholar in that side of his life. He catalogued every single collection of medieval manuscripts in Cambridge, which is an astonishing feat. But he had a catalogue's mind. He was great at lists and physically describing things. When he then moved over into ghost story vein, I'd say he was you know, one of the greatest writers of spine-chilling fiction that's ever lived. Not as a novelist. I don't think he could ever have sustained it into a full-length novel, unlike no. Muriel. <laughs> um, he's a miniaturist. A story that takes an hour to read to assemble company. That's what makes him great tapes in cars, you know. As you're driving on motorways, there is nothing like M.R. James, because they're just the right length. I think as a miniaturist, as a scholar who wrote about ghosts and scholars, I think he's absolutely...